Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us for today's webinar uh, on ultra-high-frequency ultrasound imaging for preclinical vascular disease research. And we're happy to, uh, to introduce you to Dr. Julius DeCano, who's coming to us uh, from Brigham and Women's Hospital, uh, Harvard School of Medicine. I just want to really quickly introduce our speaker today. Uh, Dr. DeCano received his doctorate in medicine at the St. Luke's College of Medicine, St. Luke's Medical Center in the Philippines, and finished his pre-med bachelor's degree in molecular biology and biotechnology at the University of the Philippines in Diliman. Um, at Brigham, Brigham Women's and, and Harvard Medical School, he's currently doing research on surgical preclinical models of, of vascular disease, essentially looking at things like uh, graft failure, uh, looking at, at targets and biomarkers for treatment, uh, and he's also doing research on uh, calcified aortic valve disease. Uh, and he's going to describe some of his uh, research with us just now. Uh, I think I'm going to hand it over uh, to Dr. DeCano. Uh, Dr. DeCano, thanks and, and welcome. Uh, thank you, Drew. Thanks, Drew. Um, I'm glad to be here. Um, I'll, I'd like to welcome all the listeners. Um, uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to show you some really nice, really cool um, ultrasound images uh, on vascular disease, um, or at least vascular targets. And um, so, yes, um, the title of my talk is um, High Resolution Ultrasound Imaging and Biomicroscopy for Preclinical Vascular Disease Research. And um, I hope everyone can see this um, image I'm showing um, as my first slide. Uh, this is actually an image of a human vein, a superficial vein in the forearm. Um, and I used uh, the Vivo 3100 uh, ultrasound machine to get this image. And I'd like to show you guys how uh, detailed um, this can be. Uh, showing, uh, you can see the top part and the bottom part in the middle of this um, uh, video clip uh, are actually right. venous valves. Um, they kind of looks like slugs, um, which um, I guess most of the uh, medical um, students are listening right now. Um, it's hard to imagine uh, learning this in our textbooks uh, with just a diagram of the valve, um, not thinking about it as like a, a really thick three-dimensional uh, view as the way we can see it in um, imaging modalities. So um, that's just a preamble. Um, I'd like to, before I uh, start my um, presentation proper, I'd like to just uh, mention to everyone that um, I actually work at the Center for Interdisciplinary Cardiovascular Sciences. It's uh, um, an operation under the Cardiovascular Division of the Brigham and Women's Hospital here in Longwood Medical Area in Boston. Um, we also have an, an appointment with the Harvard Medical School and our institute is pretty unique uh, right now uh, in, our, in our field of research just because it's, um, well, we're kind of like a hybrid institution uh, of academia, hospital, and uh, a pharmaceutical company. And our uh, main uh, sponsor is actually the Japanese pharmaceutical company, Koa. Um, I belong to the Masanori Aikawa lab. Uh, Masanori Aikawa is my PI. Um, he is actually... Uh, also, our um, founding director for our center, um, he's an associate professor of medicine here at Harvard Medical School. And what he strived to do here in our center is actually to do um, accelerated targeted target discovery and yeah. drug development. Um, you see, conventional drug development paradigm typically involves target discovery first, which involves years and years of academic research in, base, in laboratories, basic science, it's exploratory, um, it's, it tends to be very mechanistic, and uh, uses a lot of animal models to screen for targets. After which, any promising target still needs to be fully developed before handing them over to, let's say, an industry. And usually, these are found by um, academic professors. They do startup ventures. There's a seed investment involved. And they need to do more uh, proof of concept experiments to really show uh, the value of these targets. After which, um, after everything is uh, 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 um, developed and um, seen as promising, uh, the pharma drug development comes in where you have drug development expertise coming from scientists in um, the industry. 
then we do typically do large scale preclinical studies and if everything goes well it progresses to clinical trials and it goes without saying that typically you have uh, when you're developing drug you start off with hundreds upon thousands of uh, candidate uh, drugs in which you filter them out through a, a sequential um, selection. In our center, um, my, my boss, uh, Dr. Aikawa, has um, uh, made it a point to have uh, Harvard Medical School academic researchers and uh, COVA pharmaceutical scientists to work in a shared space so that we can have a fully integrated uh, drug discovery research. So uh, the vascular imaging uh, experiments that we typically do at our center um, revolves around several disease models. And for this uh, seminar, I would like to just uh, present four types. Um, let's start the one that is closest to the heart, which is aortic valve disease, and how we typically use um, imaging to evaluate this model. And then we have um, aortic aneurysm, um, AV fistula, and then uh, also the vein graft uh, disease or vein graft failure. And we are able to do this just because we have uh, the Visual Sonics uh, Vivo 2100 machine, which is a high resolution uh, ultrasound machine. Um, typically, it's, uh, it affords very high portability. You can roll it um, from uh, uh, one location to another. It has exceptional spatial resolution. In fact, it can even resolve um, up to 30 uh, micrometers lateral resolution um, in there in the 50 megahertz um, probe. Um, you can actually acquire images uh, really fast um, as long as you uh, you prepare your um, uh, uh, animal uh, properly and you can reach your targets um, at a record time. And because uh, this machine is uh, capable of um, very high resol uh, temporal resolution, um, especially if you use the um, EKV package. So the EKV package is um, the ECG-based kilohertz visualization, um, which is capable of acquiring up to 10,000 frames per second. That affords a very good uh, delineation of the time frames, especially if you're uh, doing an M-mode acquisition imaging. Um, as I've said, uh, uh, the imaging microtargets can also be, even though you have a high resolution, the power of penetration for um, the probes can reach up to depths of three centimeters and it's usually good enough for most um, small animal imaging. Uh, with the 30, Vivo 3100, it can even go further, I believe, uh, because you can do a, like a digital um, uh, modification of the foci of um, imaging. So let's start um, this, uh, talking about uh, the aortic valve disease imaging. So with this um, ultrasound machine, you can actually see uh, clearly the aortic valve in mice and rats, um, uh, showing the opening and closing of the valves, similar to in human beings. So you can clearly see here, if you are on axis, it is possible to see the trileaflet structure of the tricuspid valve, or rather the aortic uh, valve. Um, here uh, we have uh, uh, an example of uh, aortic valve thickening. Um, one of my uh, co-fellows at the center, Dr. Florian Schlotter, has developed his own uh, model of um, aortic stenosis um, by doing a, 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 a bio injury model and here he is here you can clearly see a, a, de a deformed and thickened valve uh, because of the injury it, it is not opposing very well um, and here on the left side you can clearly see uh, a normal valve opposing um, because uh, you can uh, if you do an EKV as well it, it's even more uh, clear uh, to show this motion and the motion abnormality. Both images are taken at long axis view. So um, you can also assess uh, typically a blood flow uh, before or after uh, the opening of the valves um, if you have a good uh, um, inclination of uh, your angle of insonation. 
So typically what we do is uh, we try to do a color Doppler of where and see where the blood flows. And if you can get a really nice a laminar flow of a solid color, then you know that uh, it is much easier to put your sampling uh, cursor for the pulse wave Doppler um, in that area. So in this example, we typically do our sampling at a specific angle for the insonation or the Doppler angle. Um, typically a Doppler angle should be less than 60 degrees uh, from the axis of the probe um, where the blood flow should have that angle forming with the um, axis of the transducer. But in our center we are a little more strict and we typically want to do, if we can do a less than or equal to 30 degree angle, the better. And you can see here on the right side, uh, if doing that can give you a very nice, very clean, uh, no background uh, waveforms of the pulse wave Doppler. They're almost shaped like Santoku knives and you can clearly see the peak systolic velocity. So here's an example of uh, uh, aortic regurgitation. Um, if you have uh, valves that are not opposing very well, typically after uh, uh, systole, uh, sometimes if it does not close very well during diastole, there's leakage uh, in, in, a, in an uh, insufficient valve. And you can see here, this is an example of a hollow diastolic uh, aortic regurgitation. Um, aortic stenosis can also be found in uh, normally occurring uh, valves, um, rather um, congenitally occurring valves like the bicuspid valve. You can see here that in the mouse, it, bicuspid valves uh, also occur and typically produce um, aortic stenosis, um, so to speak. Uh, with a normal valve, you typically have uh, uh, a normal uh, velocity a peak velocity similar to humans uh, approaching up to one meter per second. But if you have aortic stenosis because of a bicuspid valve, you have a very high velocity blood flow through that valve. And here you can see that the peak velocity is reaching to near four meters per second, so that's pretty fast. And that's already a sign of a stenotic opening. opening. But in fact, you can actually still measure the area or to quantify aortic stenosis using your PW measurements along with uh, B-mode structural morpho uh, morphometry by using the continuity equation. And in the continuity equation, typically you sample um, uh, one area of pulse wave uh, Doppler and uh, B-mode cross-sectional area at the left ventricular outflow track, seen in red here, and then one that just right after the opening of the valve. Um, which we can measure as the aortic valve area. And uh, the equation simply is that uh, the product of the velocity in that area in one location should equal the same product in another location. If you have a big uh, area, typically flow should be not as fast because you have a big flow. And typically if you have a narrow opening, it ends up having a high velocity flow. Um, with the pulse wave Doppler, you can also measure the velocity time integral because throughout the ECG cycle, we know that velocity changes. So the instantaneous velocity uh, in the waveform can be accounted for by doing a VTI uh, measurement. And the equation still uh, remains um, the same. And you can see all, all that relationship here in the uh, uh, right-hand panel. So um, using P, P pulse wave do, uh, Doppler and B mode uh, and even EKV uh, mode, we can accurately measure um, aortic stenosis. So um, now if we go move on, progress even uh, further, we see uh, we can also see um, the aortic the aorta uh, using this uh, imaging method. Uh, typically, we do an ab abdominal imaging, but you can also do thoracic imaging of the aorta uh, by changing the uh, uh, position of the mouse. Um, here I'm going to show you a typical ab abdominal imaging with the Vivo 2100. Um, in the left-hand panel, you can see a long-axis view of the aorta. Uh, 
with the cross section of the renal vein crossing over in a, like a flattened oblong shape uh, over the aorta. And this is taken in EKV mode. Uh, that's why you can see a protracted ECG signal here. Uh, here is a short axis mode with the mouse aorta. You can clearly see the walls. Um, any abnormality um, around the wall can be easily seen. Um, you can actually zoom in there. And because of the clarity and the high temporal resolution of this system, you can easily differentiate the inferior vena cava from the aorta. The aorta typically pulses with the ECG signal, while the um, inferior vena cava uh, dilates and relaxes um, with the respiration or the movement of diaphragm as seen in the, this yellow uh, waveforms down below. Um, you, again, you can zoom into a specific area, whether short axis or long axis, and you can measure diameters of the lumen in the aorta, as you can see in the bottom panel, as well as the wall thickness. So typically, uh, there are several ways to make an aneurysm model in the mouse. I'm just showing everyone here uh, one method. Uh, it's a pretty uh, popular method that people do is using angiotensin to um, osmotic pop delivery to develop and wait for abdominal aortic aneurysm to develop uh, around like three to four weeks after implantation. And here you can see a nice um, a color Doppler overlaid to a B mode image of uh, the aneurysm in this yellow rectangle. Here you can see uh, formation of intraluminal thrombus on the right side, shown as a gray uh, in between echogenicity to the color flow. And then the, on its left side, you have an empty, almost an empty space that we typically um, uh, say is an, uh, or, uh, a false lumen or pseudo lumen uh, that typically occurs because of the weakness of the wall of the aorta. So this is a pretty nice uh, picture to quantify and show uh, the severity of the aneurysm. Normally, an abdominal uh, aorta should have no pseudo lumen. It, has, it should have normal thickness of the walls and no um, thrombus uh, at its sides. So another way to measure this is through um, measuring the arterial distensibility. Um, let's say in a developing uh, aneurysm or just before an aneurysm may develop. Um, or in, in just uh, as a typical measurement of arterial stiffness, uh, you can use uh, M mode and B mode of the um, aorta to measure changes in the diameter during systole and diastole. And here in this panel here that I just unblurred, you have the expert consensus on the arterial stiffness. Typically you use this equation down below with the red, red rectangle. Uh, if you measure the diameter at systole and the diastole, you get the difference of their squares and divide it by the product of the original diameter squared multiplied by the pulse pressure. Now, the pulse pressure is simply just the difference between the systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure. So when doing this kind of measurements, it is advisable that um, experimenters also try to get uh, blood pressure measurements either through tail cuff measurements or what I, as what I did in my previous um, appointment, um, we did a wireless telemetry, uh, BP telemetry um, measurements. Okay. Uh, now, um, now, this is a project that's more uh, uh, that uh, that's I'm more concerned about because um, uh, this is about uh, a failure of veins that have been arterialized. One of the diseases that we model this uh, phenomenon with is arteriovenous fistula. So, arteriovenous fistulas are typically used in hemodialysis patients. It's a lifeline for chronic renal patient renal failure patients. And typically, when you create an AV fistula on their arms, it doesn't really mm, uh, last that long. And currently, there is no medical therapy to mitigate uh, the failure of AV fistulas. So to model the AV fistulas, uh, we tried to, uh, 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 in the mouse, we tried to connect the external jugular vein to the left common carotid artery. Um, this is uh, credited to our microsurgeon in our center, uh, Dr. Henning Zhang. And uh, here we're trying to mimic the site to end anastomosis seen in the Brescia Semino uh, type 
of fistula. Uh, we model this in this, uh, it's similar to the, the model shown in this paper down below by Wong et al. And if you use um, ultrasound uh, color Doppler, you can clearly see on the left side panel the anastomosis of the vein to the uh, common carotid artery. Uh, turbulence of flow as seen as multicolored uh, color, color flow, and then after the anastomosis, you have a typical laminar flow um, that is seen uh, in a normal vessel. On the right panel, this is uh, uh, a non-surgical side where you can see there, since there is no exit um, port for the blood and no turbulence happening. Um, it's a typical of the arterial flow. So this is a diagram in one of the papers that also tried to do um, AV fistula models um, just to uh, show everyone that uh, this portion that that of the carotid of the artery that, that occurs proximal to the anastomosis, we'll call that a proximal limb of the artery. Typically, is the one that changes, um, that has blood flow changes, if there are changes in the vein limb. It is because blood coming from here has an option of exiting through the vein or continuing to the distal arm of the artery. So this is a, a four-dimensional imaging uh, that can be done in the Vivo 3100. When you do a vena, uh, AV fistula model, uh, imaging it can be tricky just because uh, um, the, the orientation of the limbs can be confusing. However, imagine a, a functionality where you can have both um, high temporal resolution and three-dimensional morphometry then you can typically rotate uh, the image uh, with real-time images, as you can see here, and figure out the orientation of your limbs. You can see here, uh, even the sutures in the anastomosis can be seen clearly uh, by um, ultrasound. And here you have a three-dimensional power Doppler, I mean, sorry, color Doppler, to even further confirm uh, the three-dimensional direction of the blood flow. Um, And uh, it's, a, it's a good thing that Visual Sonics developed uh, the multi-slice viewer, um, which allows for individual uh, 2D slice frame measurements. Uh, if you want to measure, let's say, the volume of the venous limb uh, to, to check if there is a formation of plaque in there or any space occupying lesion like a, a thrombus, for example, uh, by doing the multi-slice of your tracing, you can jump between um, frame to frame and it intelligently figures out the, the tracing in between uh, your selected intervals, leading to a very carefully rendered uh, three-dimensional volume and uh, basically assessment of the entire space that you're trying to measure. So if, typically, if we develop um, stenosis, um, in this vein, um, you can just imagine the volume will be much less and narrower. Another way that I typically use to uh, visualize um, uh, uh, an AV fistula is by its, uh, the physiology of its uh, blood flow. As I've mentioned earlier, the area over here where you have the proximal artery have a peculiar blood flow, as you can see here. You have a tall and uh, fast velocity, this peak systolic velocity. However, your end diastolic velocity is also um, high. Uh, the reason for this is that at the end of diastole, instead of the blood slowing down to a halt, normally in the normal arterial branch, because it has a conduit outside, it continues to run and flow at a high velocity. So imagine if that uh, conduit closes up, the blood has nowhere to go, but rather its natural course, which is to the arterioles and, and the capillaries, which affords the arterial resistance, which causes the decrease in your velocity going from systole to diastole. And a measure of that uh, is actually the resistive index. It measures 
kind of measures the the resistance that blood is going against and it's you can we can uh, uh, say that the peak systolic velocity in that area minus the end diastolic velocity divided by the peak systolic velocity you can get the uh, uh, resistive index so typically uh, an open vein would open AV fistula would uh, you can imagine that it should give us a very small number of for the resistive index however um, as weeks go by, uh, uh, we typically use a dyslipidemic mouse model. Uh, plaque and thrombi tend to develop in the venous limb of the AV fistula. As you can see here, clearly in the B-mode image, uh, plaque and thrombi forming near uh, the anastomosis. Uh, that causes turbulent flow after laminar flow, uh, as you can see here, um, in this uh, color Doppler overlay. Now eventually when um, the blockage develops completely, you can imagine that there's no more um, exit point for the blood. The blood flow now uh, mimics uh, a typical laminar uh, pattern of a, not as though it was not um, operated on or it's like a, a closed system, so to speak. And you can even see rem remnants of the turbulent flow uh, at the anastomosis site. And one would expect the resistive index would probably be high. Because in the Doppler waveform, you can see now that uh, the end diastolic volume now has a very low value compared to the PSV, which is opposite uh, from an open AVF as you've seen in my earlier slide. So finally, um, I'd like to talk about the other uh, arterialization model, vein arterialization model, the vein graft disease. So this is a project that I'm still currently working on, um, but I'm going to show some um, data that uh, kind of supports the importance of uh, preclinical imaging uh, in assessing this uh, disease. So as I've said, both AVF and vein graft failure have a common shared biology. Um, typically because the veins are arterialized, they, have, they experience the same adaptation to different hemodynamic conditions from uh, uh, where they started, as well as adaptation to an increased oxygen tension. Uh, Peri-adaptation factors typically uh, form a thromboinflammatory climate uh, leading to uh, the occlusion as you've seen earlier. So like AVF, vein graft uh, failure typically does not have uh, uh, medical uh, treatment. Uh, vein grafts it's themselves are treatment for another disease, which is peripheral artery disease, and in some cases, um, coronary artery disease. Um, typically, 50% of vein grafts fail within a year, and um, the only options you have would be revascularization or amputation of the limb. Um, Coronary artery bypass grafts also use veins uh, uh, frequently to bypass arteries in addition to artery segments, especially if you have a multi-vessel disease. So to model this uh, failure of the vein graft, uh, we uh, looked to this um, earlier pioneering work done by in the lab of Dr. C. Keith Ozaki here in the Brigham as well um, by uh, his postdoc at that time, Dr. Pen Yu. Uh, you typically transplant the supra-diaphragmatic um, IVC into the carotid artery of the mouse. And again, our microsurgeon, Dr. Hamin Zhang, uh, did all the microsurgeries uh, for this study. And we're using the cuff technique to oppose them. So here, uh, using the Vivo 2100, you can see in the left screen, uh, we can uh, evaluate a newly implanted vein. Uh, you can still see the cuffs on each side, and you can see the vein here that's uh, pretty straight, uh, uh, healthy looking, no, no plusy blood flow coming off of it as well. In three weeks of um, high fat diet, uh, if you have LDLR knockout mice to use for this model, this vein graft 
uh, typically develops plaque very clearly, as you can see here. You can see the bifurcation of the original carotid artery here attached to the um, cuff, and uh, you have near intimal formation starting here in the proximal side at near the attachment of the proximal cuff as well. So we wanted to know if it was worth using the LDL or knockout mice going forward uh, because we do believe that if you do a uh, vein graft on wild type mice as well, uh, they would also develop plaques. Um, but we wanted to see which one could give us a, a faster uh, a plaque development. And as you can see here, using VivoVasc um, uh, software, uh, which is also part of the package uh, sold by uh, Visual Sonics, we can quickly assess the intimal media thickness uh, of the plaque, uh, the long axis, and confidently say that uh, this epidemic uh, model uh, would have definitely have an accelerated vein graft lesion development and failure. Therefore, uh, more suitable for our purposes of testing drugs and targets. Uh, we also use uh, ultrasound to make sure that uh, our histology um, uh, that it actually um, um, approximates histologic morphometry well. And you can see here in the correlation plot that indeed high resolution ultrasound does, is very faithful uh, in terms of mimicking a, a well prepared histologic section of the same sample. And because of that, we can even go further and rather than, than just measuring area of the plaque, we can render it into a, a 3D volume like in the ABF that I've shown earlier. And therefore, accurate 2D ultrasound plaque tracing can be rendered into an accurate 3D volume calculation. So doing that in uh, four different time points, I realized that um, everything, uh, uh, all the plaques are um, uh, developing uh, at the middle of the two week to three week time period after the implantation, they typically accelerate, uh, almost tapering off near the four week time point. And because of that, I knew that a uh, four weeks time point would be an ideal uh, hunting trip, so to speak, for uh, targets uh, uh, to see. And you can see this histology that majority of the plaques are composed of macrophages staining with CD68. However, we do still do see some uh, vascular smooth muscle cells um, coming up here near the luminal side uh, of the plaque. And we can hunt for targets uh, in this plaque by doing uh, proteomics. Uh, and here I actually dissected out the plaque from the adventitial layer of the vein graft and use the non-arterialized inferior vena cava of the same animal to use as an endogenous control and did an, un, uh, an unbiased uh, proteomic um, uh, screening uh, with the help of our director, Dr. Sasha Singh, um, in our center. And we found that there are proteins indeed that are truly upregulated, as you can see here in white, um, uh, among my ne uh, neo-intima or plaque samples whereas the advent tissue of the vein graft itself has very similar proteomic pattern with uh, the normal inferior vena cava. So using these data set, I did another set of experiments of doing a time course proteomics as well, similar to the time course imaging that I did for um, uh, the vein graft ultrasound. Uh, so I can therefore look into uh, the the proteome profile and figure out what proteins are probably most um, concerned about uh, concerned with regards to the development of the plaque or the disease itself. So using computational methods um, and network analysis, we actually found uh, drug target A. Now for the purposes of this um, uh, seminar. Um, I'd, ra I'd rather not talk about the specific target that we found. Um, it is still ongoing, but you can, I'd just like to let everyone know that you can use in vivo imaging to go well with uh, typical uh, multi-omics um, approaches done these days to search for targets, biomarkers, and evaluate uh, your drugs. So we found this drug target A and 
we hypothesize that if we have a drug target that uh, affects this uh, typical, yeah, if we have a drug, a small molecule drug that affects this target, it hopefully can reduce macrophage inflammation and activation accumulation in the vein graft, therefore mitigate lesion development in the vein grafts. So that's the hypothesis. And to test that, again, we rely on ultrasound imaging to do a, a randomized blind uh, drug trial, if you may, among animals, uh, where we have animals uh, having done surgery and uh, separating them uh, through uh, either placebo or drug diet. Um, so I, being the experimenter, are, am unaware of the assignments. And only after finishing all the imaging and assessment by ultrasound, histology, and uh, blood chemistry did we reveal the code to figure out if our drug truly uh, mitigated vein graft lesion development. And I was happy to see that uh, by ultrasound, uh, our drug definitely had a much uh, less uh, affected, uh, affected a less um, lesion development in, in animals. Um, however, as uh, the four weeks approaches, the statistical significance disappears, although there is still a trend that the drug seems to decrease uh, vein graft lesion development. And um, it is already known in the past that size doesn't matter when it comes to atherosclerosis or atherosclerosis like plaques. It, rather, it's the inflammation that is more important. Statins, for example, can reduce acute coronary events in atherosclerosis, but they only modestly reduce arterial stenosis. Likewise, macrophages are therefore central in the atherogenesis and since they contribute to the disruption of uh, the atheroma. And tr true enough, uh, after um, again some uh, randomized and blind analysis, we realized that uh, the drug does indeed um, decrease accumulation of macrophages without affecting um, the number of vascular smooth muscle cells in the lesion. Um, in, um, in, and as you can see, uh, subsequently, if you have uh, less macrophage accumulation, you would think about less protease activation coming from the macrophages, less collagenase expression. And if you look at the collagen staining of these lesions, you can appreciate that um, the lesions in the drug group tend to have a more stable forms of collagen, less friable, and, more, and typically mimics, or so to speak, um, uh, a stable plaque. However, um, the placebo group had more of the green staining fibers by Picrocerus red. Uh, typically, these green fibers represent fragmented, degraded, and, and this is uh, statistically different between the groups. So in summary, I would say that high-resolution ultrasound imaging has accelerated the development research in our center because you have a high frequency echo uh, that you can measure surrogate endpoints quickly and run an experiment fairly quickly. Uh, you can do longitudinal tracking of microstructure and measure physiologic parameters. So you don't need to do cross-sectional studies, uh, which is not as powerful as a longitudinal monitoring of the same patient, so to speak. It is practical and fairly cost-effective compared to other imaging modalities in the cardiovascular field, like cardiac MRI or cardiac PET scan. Um, it's semi-automated post-processing. It is fairly quick to operate, and one can easily learn off the cuff. It is technically feasible, and you know, it's basically it's easy to learn. And it's actually adaptable across various preclinical systems, not just vascular, cardiovascular. You can use it in cancer research, rheumatology, musculoskeletal, and even lung uh, for some reason, for some people. And that's, I think I've, I've uh, had collaborated before with a dermatology research group. Um, one of their high-resolution probes are actually good in studying the skin. So recent innovations uh, done by Fujifilm as well in Visual Sonics afford, uh, uh, give us technology that can broaden the functionality and applicability of ultrasound. Um, I'm speaking, of course, of about um, the Vivo laser system, um, 
nanoparticle contrast imaging, and uh, photoacoustics. So with that, I'd like to end my lecture. Um, I'd like to thank uh, my center. Uh, this is uh, members of our center. Um, I've learned, um, and our sponsor, COA. Um, this is our building. And I'd like to thank Sonics for giving me this opportunity uh, to show the value of, of vascular imaging with um, high resolution ultrasound. Um, Drew, uh, I think I'm open for questions. Great. Thanks very much, Dr. DeCano. It's a, a very interesting uh, topic and a great talk. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time uh, to, to present all this material. I'm actually going to leave uh, leave you with your slides there. There are a few questions just in case you need to kind of go back to them. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so one, one question we've got here is uh, using VivoVasc, there, the software produces a lot of data points, um, but what, what, which of those data points and what, what, what data do you find most useful uh, or revealing from the, the VivoVasc data? Um, so for the VivoVasc data, the, mo the features that I use uh, more frequently than the others, although I'm not saying the others are not informative. O obviously, all, all the features have, to me uh, give robust data. But uh, for me, speed is important, so I like the IMT, uh, um, automatic IMT measurement. I, I like uh, the pulse wave uh, propagation uh, of measurement of a stiff vessel stiffness. It's typically used for arterial stiffness. Um, I did not show that data here just because um, I used to use it uh, for a hypertensive model um, back in, in another institution. Um, uh, it, you can do a typical arterial st stiffness um, measurement by doing a pulse wave velocity measurement, so that's different, uh, and then do a parallel uh, pulse wave propagation measurement and then, like what I've shown in my slide uh, earlier, a third measurement of arterial stiffness would be uh, uh, this uh, example, which is more simple, distensibility. So I think, for me, at least for the VivoVasc, IMT, automatic distensibility measurement, and pulse propagation, velocity are most helpful. But again, I mean, you can play around with the other uh, functionality and confirm with physical experiments like elasticity, uh, ex vivo elasticity of the tissue. Okay, okay, yeah. great, thanks very much. Mm -hmm. um, another question we have here is, um, why were you connecting the jugular vein to the carotid artery and not just doing a bypass alone? Um, it says here, like it, like it is done when doing, you know, bypass uh, surgery for arterial occlusion. Oh, um, just because uh, doing the bypass, um, at least in our hands, is a, a little more difficult in terms of developing the model. When you want to develop a model, you want something that's consistent, and you need to focus really on what is important for you. Um, I guess if hemodynamics and like the direction of the blood flow is more important for you, um, you can do the bypass uh, method. But we, you, again, you have that problem of making sure that it is so consistent that it stands the test of a blind trial, or a blind drug trial. In our hands, we wanted to focus more on the inflammation of part of uh, the vein graft failure and in there, uh, doing the cuff technique of vein implantation was very much consistent and easy to measure exhaustively with the ultrasound. I mean, it's so, we don't have the Vivo 3100. You have the Vivo 2100 with three-dimensional motor or 3D functionality. And it's much more consistent for me to get a really crisp and clear uh, 3D data in any ultrasound data if that was the method that we used. So uh, again, it really depends on your goal. In, in my case, I really um, focus on the inflammation and macrophages and the consistency of my in vivo imaging. 
Okay, great. So you just sort of optimized your, your model for the, the sort of question you were trying to ask exactly. and, and how well the, the technology helps you achieve the, the, yeah. the data. Yeah, and the scale of the microsurgeon also. I just want to add that. We're talking about a, a field of view of a very small, like two to three millimeter by three millimeter view. I mean, you can be limited by that. They're talking about mice after all. Yeah, that's, that's no small thing. Um, yeah. that actually, a, a related question to that, I, I think, um, is uh, uh, someone else has asked, is it possible to measure flow in, in really small vessels uh, like femoral vein or femoral artery in rats? Okay, actually for me, <clears throat> that is not small. I mean, when you're using the Vivo 2100, that's <clears throat> that already affords you a, a big enough um, view. The technique there is, though, it's finding a really good um, wi uh, acoustic window. Using the right probe, maybe um, uh, a higher resolution probe like uh, the MX700 uh, uh, with a 50 megahertz uh, frequency, and have your target, let's say the femoral vein, very superficial. If you're on axis, you will see it very clearly, and then control the sector width and length and height and then zoom in using the image depth and image um, zoom, I think, and then control uh, uh, the foci depth and the number mm -hmm. of foci. And then if you use the, the, you can take advantage of the time gain compensation settings to really make the image pop out. If you can see a very nice B mode, and then you can see a very nice color Doppler as well, you will have a very nice Pulse rate Doppler of that um, vascular target. Um, I'm pretty sure of that. So, what, what about um, what about coronary arteries? Um, coronary arteries. Um, I've I've tried imaging them as well uh, before. Yes, you can see them, but um, you may need to gate for the ECG because the heart is moving. Um, this is more feasible in rats. Um, and the part of the coronary that is uh, near uh, uh, the root of the aorta. But we're, if we're talking about a long um, length of coronary, it will right. be difficult. Again, if you're on axis and you keep on seeing the long axis view, a very nice long axis view of the coronary, especially the right coronary, uh, you can potentially just do a, a, a T1, T2 gating on the ECG, a physio physiology panel, mm -hmm. uh, and then you can see, um, you can measure um, structure though, I'm sorry, you can measure structure, but if you're cutting the ECG, you can't really see a good flow there. Right, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, okay, thanks. Um, <laughs> how about the, just a comparison of uh, the, the sort of physiology and flow dynamics of, of the clinical AV fistula, how does that compare to your experimental models for the anastomosis? Um, I think it um, compares pretty well. Um, I have other parameters that I'm, I'm thinking of uh, to test uh, for the openness, but I, I think the resistivity index is pretty straightforward already, and someone has reported it uh, in the literature already as a measure of openness of the, the vein uh, implant, uh, vein limb. And this model, for example, since everything is small, everything is um, close together, uh, that relationship is still is, is very uh, well appreciated. In terms of the clinical aspect, um, I, I suppose we'll just have to, uh, to, to test it, but Theoretically, structurally, it should follow the same um, uh, waveform. Uh, but again, uh, you can definitely discuss. You can reach me um, with the uh, in my email. Um, uh, down below. Um, so this is the the resistivity index equation. Um, hopefully, you can. Uh, uh, try to test it out yourself. Uh, again, this is a very new model for us as well. It's still currently being developed, and I myself, I'm still looking at different parameters that, uh, that can be easily translated um, clinically. Right, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. 
Great. Uh, just one one sort of last more more general mm -hmm. question about uh, the equipment and in, in your imaging core. You know, just a question about how 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 much is ultrasound used there, and and what other modalities are used. Okay. Um, uh, first of all, um, in our center, we, um, we're not exactly a core facility. Um, our center owns our own equipment, our own ultrasound equipment. We use it quite frequently. Um, there is another study that I did about uh, for uh, um, heart failure. Um, post myocardial infarction heart failure. And we also have a, a catheter blood pressure measuring device from Millar. Mm -hmm. um, you can connect it actually with the machine and get pressure volume data loops um, of, uh, for your MI study. We use it a lot. Uh, we're doing actively doing aortic aneurysm studies right now on aortic valve studies. Uh, and uh, we don't do cancer. Um, but I have done it in another institution that I used to work for. Um, uh, if you're looking, if you're nearby, uh, there is actually a core facility uh, at the Harvard Medical School run by Dr. Rong Li Liao, and she's very um, accommodating uh, for for you for researchers here. So that's another tip. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's uh, that's all I've got. I, I just want to thank you uh, once again, Dr. Decano, for taking the time uh, and, and doing this and, and presenting mm -hmm. your really, uh, really neat results. It's a really nice sort of picture of you know not just how the equipment is used, but how you know the data fits into a larger project, um, specifically with with respect to the drug development and and uh, this kind of thing. So thanks very much again.